Welcome to Inside the Creator Studio, an origin story podcast about the world's best video content creators. My name is Katie Kane. And my name is Mo O'Keefe. On today's show, we have Emily D. Baker, a long form live stream content creator, podcaster, lawyer, and former LA Deputy District Attorney, coined the Internet's go to legal analyst, covering high profile cases such as Depp v. Heard and the Murdoch murders. We're going to talk to her about building a devoted community, why she turns down deals from large media companies, and how she makes the law more accessible to the public. This show is brought to you by StreamYard, a browser-based tool that lets you record remote podcasts in studio quality and live stream to multiple platforms at the same time. It's built for creators to make your job way easier, and it's what we use to record this podcast. Emily D. Baker, welcome to the show. Hi, thank you for having me. I'm so excited. We're so happy to have you here. You're a big StreamYard fan, so we knew we had to have you on the podcast, even though it's not entirely StreamYard centric. You have a lot of insight that I think our audience will really take to heart. We would love to know in our series of rapid fire questions to start out, what is your setup for this call? Tell us your computer, your camera, your lights, your microphone, your in-ear headphones that we were talking about before. (laughs) That'd be great to know. Oh gosh, I'm so bad with the tech stuff. I am on a Mac studio. I burned through like four or five different laptops trying to figure out the right one to stream the way I stream because I stream for such a long period of time. So the Mac studio is the GOAT computer. I have a multi-monitor setup with a vertical and very large curved horizontal. Those are both Samsung the mic is a Shure SM7B on my beloved OC White arm because you have to be able to move. You have to be able to move the mic when you're streaming. That's all run through a Rodecaster Pro 2 with Shure in ears. I think they are the 425s and a Sony camera with a fixed Sony lens. That's a, what is it? 24 a 24 lens. So. Which Sony camera? No, I no idea. <laughs> I know. I hear you. I hear you. My boyfriend's really into Fuji and I mixed up two of the names today and he was like, what are you talking about? And I was like, I don't know. The X something maybe. I, I literally went to, went to look at which cameras had the cleanest and easiest output for streaming. And the Sony has such an easy and clean output. I just, I needed to plug it in. Occasionally I will do TV appearances and sometimes more than occasionally. And they're like, Hey, can you adjust your camera a little bit? I'm like, no, I'm, I'm adjusting nothing. I, like actually we can. Up, I sit down, I, I press play and in StreamYard, I press go and we go like I'm moving nothing. Like I'll wheel my chair back a little bit. If you need more headroom, that's it. Yeah. No, I mean, once you got it good, it's, it's hard to mess up a good setup. Yeah. The light in front of me is an Elgato. I also use a stream deck. And then the lights behind me are all Philips Hue lights. Awesome. Fabulous. What's the most common mistake you see defendants make in high stakes cases? Early on in cases, talking about the case on social media is a huge error in once they are getting through into the trial process. It is especially in high profile cases, not being mindful that every expression they make will be captured and dissected by social media. I think it's almost an impossible task for uh, defendants in high profile cases that are on camera because everything they do is picked apart. But if they respond to that on social or engage in that or even watch it, I think it can be super detrimental. Yeah, 100%. I know you have a partnership with the makeup brand Gerard Cosmetics. With them, you've released three lip gloss shades, which is your favorite. Oh gosh, I love them all, but I think my regular go-to is hearsay. I love the clear one. That's my favorite. Okay. And the clear one facts because it I felt like it was just the facts. Like it's your lips with a little bit of gloss and glitter. So that's facts. why the name. But I started using those lip glosses while streaming because they didn't make my lips sticky when you talk, which for a 60 second video might not be something you think of, but when you talk for three, four, five, six hours a day, it becomes hugely important. Yeah. No, I'm a big fan of them. Truly, I really love them and everybody should go check them out. What is your favorite case that you've ever covered in a stream? My favorite case, and and there are some that have run for it because I love covering live trial, but my favorite case hands down is Colin versus Cuthbert, which is a case over Caterpillar Cakes out of the UK because it was one of the funniest food cases I've ever covered. And it was between very iconic, literally Caterpillar cake that you would buy at a variety of different retailers. 
And so the larger retailer M&S sued Aldi in the UK over the cakes and Aldi made it an entire social media campaign. And it was absolutely hilarious. Aldi's social media team leaned in to, we're going to win the court of public opinion. And M&S just got absolutely obliterated in the court of public opinion. They won in the court of law, but Aldi won our hearts with their cheeky social media campaign. So when I say defendants should stay off of social media, there is a little bit of an exception for large corporate entities that have like a full social media team and a PR team, because it's a little bit different when corporations are fighting over the style of a box than when somebody is fighting over defamation. Wow. Yeah. I mean, I think we would have all lost out if Aldi didn't do such a thing. That's so funny. What was your favorite year of law school? If you have one. Law school is Uh, law school is an adventure. I think 3L is one of my favorite years because I had a lot of classes with friends. It felt like we were preparing to study for the bar. And there were a lot of classes because I'm very ADHD where we would sit and watch a movie. So my friend would put a movie on their laptop. We would share earbuds and I would take notes for class. And I got an entire like film school lesson in movies by a friend that was much more into films than I was. So 3L was a lot of fun and getting ready for the bar was fun. I also really enjoyed my work experiences leading up to 3L in the summer. 1L is absolutely brutal. Yeah. I just had a friend who finished law school. So that's why I wanted to ask. And yeah, oh, I don't envy her. I don't envy her. Uh, it's a gauntlet. It's it's absolutely a gauntlet. And you, you, you know, I look at people that are like, why is everybody paying this much money for Barry's boot camp? And why are you paying to get brutalized? I'm like, have you looked at how much law school costs? Like it's the same. You are paying to go through the gauntlet <laughs> and you're not going to be fit at the end of it. Like it is yeah. expensive. Honestly. Oh my gosh. That's so true. What is the craziest thing one of your law nerds has said in the chat? Oh gosh. I mean, I I don't know how to define crazy because people ask me this about my DA work too. Like what's the craziest case you've ever seen? But I think one of my favorite days was the day we were streaming. I have a, uh, I have a lot of props. I've basically become a morning radio show, but I was sent a screaming goat who, have you heard the screaming goat? No. Um, Oh, I've seen the video. I've seen the video. Lawyers are very annoying in court. Sometimes they get a goat scream because nothing else will do. But I was so frustrated with an attorney. I dropped the goat and his one ear broke off. So he only has one ear. And one of the law nerds said immediately, well, now that's Vincent Van Goat. And oh, <laughs> is, a, is now an official, official representative of the channel. So, so quick. It was immediate. It was immediate. And I, you know, on a small day, we stream to about 10,000 live concurrent. So the amount of wit and humor in my community is something that I absolutely live for. And it's really fun to see if I start quoting song lyrics, they will continue singing in the chat until the song is complete, like line by line. And with StreamYard, it's so easy to see it pulled up in the sidebar while I'm streaming and watching trial. So it's really fun to be able to see that interaction. They are the smartest community on the internet. And I will fight anyone who wants to, to challenge me on that. Yeah, no, they're, they're so fast too. I was watching it and I'm like, I, I don't even know how you find the best stuff. I mean, I, of course it comes into the studio with StreamYard, but like the sheer number of stuff that comes in, I would be like it the whole time. Yeah. It doesn't get wild for me until over about 50,000. Like once you're over about 50,000, the, it gets a a little bit harder to see the chat. Once we get up up upwards of a hundred thousand plus it, it gets, it gets a little difficult. And then over 200,000, the moderators are like, so we're just blocking spam bots, right? And I'm like, that's basically all, all you can do. But our like our max live concurrent was 370, upwards of 370,000 during trial. And that was before StreamYard added the ability that like member chats and super chats were auto-starred. So after that trial, when we were talking to StreamYard, they're like, would anything like make your life easier? I'm like, how can we just save all the super chats and stuff that comes in? They're like, oh, we can, we can do that and just rolled it out. And I was like, oh my God, this has made my life so much easier because you don't want to miss something, but chat moves fast with that many people in it. Oh my God. Yeah. I can only imagine. Yeah. And I've seen it, but I can't imagine being on the other end of it. So that's the end of our rapid fire section. I have a quick um, follow up yeah. on the goat. Like, is that, <laughs> is that goat electronic? Because, like, it could be a merch idea for us if we had like a puddles that quacked or something. It's, I mean, I have it, it. Somebody sent it to me off of Amazon. It has a little battery on it. So, I mean, it's a battery operated <laughs> screaming goat. It, it's, it's, 
when I tell you I've become like a morning radio show, I need like a cowbell and that it's just, yeah. we have quite a yeah. lot of sound effects. We also have a pickle. The pickle gets named after each trial. So the pickle's name currently hails back to the Hannah Gutierrez Reed trial because her phone was named Gorilla Grip and something, something that if you watch the trial, you know what the rest of that sentence is, but the pickle is now Gorilla Grip Pickle Pal, uh, hearkening back to the defendant's name of her cell phone. So the pickle yodels. Sometimes the goat will not do and you just need a yodeling pickle. These are all things that have been sent to me from the law nerds. They're like, you know what you need on stream? A yodeling pickle. And I'm like, you know what I do? And we're going to run it through the voice changer. It's fantastic. Oh that must God. be so I, fun. Yeah. And I love that so much more than a stream deck where you just press the button. You have like the physical thing and yeah. how you're creating your sound effects. We have quite a lot of physical props. It's again, the nice thing about streaming as long as I do is you build in these kind of inside jokes within the community. So occasionally when I see people in the chat getting frustrated with something that's happening in court, I'll just see goat emojis. Like the whole chat will just be goat emojis. I'm like, oh, we need to scream at this lawyer. I I, I forgot. I might've I might have been answering a text message. So it's time to scream at the lawyers, but it's, it's fun. Dang. What are the horses? Isn't there a horse? We have, we ride it on. So we do use horse emojis that are kind of to symbolize like, we need we need to talk about this immediately. When the raids happened at P. Diddy's homes, my DMs were full of horse emojis because people were like, when are we riding? Like, are we riding right now? And are we, are we covering this this minute? I'm like, this is a dynamic and breaking situation and there are no court filings yet. So we're going to, we're going to wait a minute. And so that's what, that's what the horse emojis are. They're like, we ride, we ride now. Oh my God. You have a language. Oh, we have an entire, we have an entire dictionary at this point that is very, very in, in ingrained in the community. There's, there's lore. It's, it's, we've been covering court trials now for like regularly since like October, 2020. So it's over four years, things have built from different cases, things lawyers have said in court, moments that have happened in court, things I've said on stream. So there is, there is lore. Yeah. <laughs> like you could have a whole like wiki page for all that lore. It's a lot. It is the, uh, uh, the knowledge of the community is, is pretty incredible. So it's really, it's fun to see. And it's really nice to see that the community, as people come in, they're like, what does this mean? What does that mean? And the community's very, very generous on, oh, this is that it came from this case and it came from this stream. And you know, go check out that stream. And occasionally people will clip those things out and be like, oh, it's, it's, this is like the moment that that thing happened. And so it's, it's here. This is the origin story of like, we had a hashtag trending on Twitter during a very long and, and, you know, off color evening stream. And so now that will get referred back to because we started trending for that hashtag number one on Twitter worldwide. And they actually gave us the little description. So when you see the trending page, there was a description that said, Emily D. Baker is hosting her Friday night live stream. And that was the descriptor for hashtag would daddy stacks that was trending on Twitter <laughs> because we were making a joke about it during stream. Your community is incredible. They're incredible. I have another they're, question they're about them later. No, because I'm fascinated with them. I think it's really, really cool to build such a community. Just to start out, can you tell the audience about your story and why you decided to leave your law practice and focus on content creation? I know you have said in interviews that you make more in content creation than you ever did as a trial lawyer. Very true. True, true, true to a level that I still don't always comprehend. When I went to law school, I went to law school to become a district attorney. I knew that that's what I wanted to do. When I transferred law schools because my husband transferred jobs, the law school I went to has a very good reputation for entertainment law and trial lawyers. And so most of, of the people I joined the DA's office with had also gone to my law school just because their different law schools have different cultures of where people go. And then you have that alumni network if you want to go into large corporate law, my law school is probably not for you. If you want to go into entertainment law, yes, because you have the connections. So I knew I wanted to go to the DA's office. And at the time, it was just coming off a hiring freeze. So it was tremendously competitive. I was thrilled to get hired at the LA County District Attorney's Office. I worked there for over 10 years. When I left, I was experiencing tremendous health troubles, burnout, a spinal fusion, multiple back surgeries. And I just could not work the way that I used to. I could not be on my feet the way I used to or sitting the way I used to. So it was a difficult decision to leave, but I never thought I was going to leave a career of over 10 years as a 
criminal trial attorney to go into content creation. So I left to do consulting with online business owners and content creators because I loved it. And I had started putting videos up on YouTube in 2016 in like the tech space. I had done live streams with friends in the tech space just for community while I was recovering from multiple back surgeries. But I never thought I was going to be a front-facing content creator. When my consulting practice came to a screeching halt in 2020, because all of my clients were online business owners, content creators, and most of them also parents, they were dealing with homeschooling and their businesses and what was going on in their spouse's business and what their clients were going through. And nobody really knew what their business would look like coming out the other side of the pandemic. And so I started explaining what was going on in law at the time like the Paycheck Protection Program and things like that through active cases and a lot of them pop culture cases. And that's what I started focusing my podcast on. In September 2020, I was with a friend and we were talking about the Britney Spears conservatorship. And that day, Kanye West was putting all of his music contracts on Twitter and like flaming out on Twitter about his recording contract. But these are contracts that cost hundreds of thousands of dollars to make from lawyers that most people will never have access to. And I was at a conference talking about creatives and and trademarks. And I was like, but I really want to be talking about these documents and the things that we're learning about the music industry from these contracts being leaked online and how interesting, just interesting it is. And my friend is like, just sit down and talk about it. And so I sat down and did a vertical live stream on Instagram and people were like, no way. So that's in the contract. What else is in the contracts? And I'm like, that was a lot of fun doing it live because I could see and answer the questions. Different than a podcast, which is, much less interactive. You're just putting it out there and somebody will listen at some point. There's not even in podcasting apps a way for them to really respond or have a conversation with you. So I I said to my friend Warren, who is a part of my team, hey, is there a way to like do this and pull up documents? He literally Googled and StreamYard was the first thing that came up. And so he was like, you can you can use this. It's web-based and you can just pull up the documents. And so that's how I started streaming legal cases on YouTube. Because I was like, I, I love YouTube, but I want to have that interactivity where I can answer questions. Because at that point, after being a lawyer for 13, 14, 15 years, I forget what some of the questions might be because it's so ingrained in my understanding. So having those questions in real time helps me remember that I might be speaking about things that I'm super familiar with, but I'm not really breaking it down well enough so that the audience really understands the significant impact of, of a thing. So streaming allowed me to do that. So I was like, okay, we stream now. <laughs> and so my husband's like, what do you mean we stream now? I'm like, so I'm a YouTuber and we stream now. I'm like, my clients still don't know what's going on. And that was September, 2020. By October, the channel had hit over 10,000 subscribers. By May, 2021, we hit a hundred thousand. And it was, there was absolutely no looking back. I sent all of my clients like, I love and adore you and your business. So I'm a YouTuber now, and these are other lawyers that do similar things to what I do, and they're fantastic. And I can help make sure they understand your cases. I did a lot of calls to kind of hand people off to other attorneys and and leaned all the way into content creation. Wow. That is such a cool origin story. And it's really funny because my next question talks a little bit about what you were just saying. I did a case study with you for StreamYard, yeah. and during it, you had mentioned that in the early days of the pandemic, your viewers reached out to you with questions on the Paycheck Protection Program and other legal matters that arose from the shutdown. What was it like? Because you just mentioned you do have to sort of break it down for people who don't have that law knowledge that you do. What was it like trying to educate your audience on something so vital to their livelihoods while also learning about it yourself? And what is it like covering trials and explaining things as they happen especially as someone who live streams their content. It's almost, it feels like it's an instantaneous turnaround time, even though you have all this knowledge on the law. It, it is an instantaneous turnaround time, but I, I was a trial lawyer. Thinking on my feet in court is nothing new. And I wasn't a trial lawyer in a large corporation where you do you know depositions for everyone. You know what the questions are. You know what they're going to say. I was doing criminal trials where there, there was a trial where I was in my closing argument I didn't know that my supervising attorney had announced that I was ready on another trial that I had never seen in another courtroom. So the judge comes up looking for me as I'm giving closing argument on a trial that I am actively in. And it's like, why isn't she ready? I'm like, for what? And read the file as I was walking in and went to trial on that case 
that afternoon, picked a jury and started with witnesses. So I was used to experiencing things in real time because that's what, A, that's what the law school experience was like. And B, that's what my career was like. I'm also very ADHD. So there are some things I can process very quickly and other things I cannot. And so I leaned into the way I like to do things and I like to do things in real time. Will it always be perfect? No. Will we learn new information as it comes up? Yes. But because it's streaming, the audience also knows that. And I like breaking things down. I really leaned into financial crimes and fraud-based crimes when I was at the DA's office. One, because I'm really nosy and looking through people's bank records is absolutely fascinating. Two, not a lot of people who, who really gravitate towards number and paper cases also gravitate towards breaking it down for people. And when I looked at 12 jurors, I'm like, they just want to understand the story of what happened. And I saw my role as a trial attorney as telling the story of what this case is and why it's significant in cases that people might not understand the human side of it. It's, it's easier in violent crime. Yet people understand that. They're like, oh my God, this horrible thing happened. It's a little harder when you're dealing with paper cases. And so I found that that was really my strong suit. So I like breaking things down so people understand. And I don't know if that's because I grew up super neurodivergent and I didn't always understand. In addition to being ADHD, I'm tremendously dyslexic. So I don't feel like I always understood. So I was always looking for that moment of, oh, now I get it. Oh, now I understand how to do it. And I want my audience to experience that too. So when we make the law accessible, people feel like they're a part of the process and people should be a part of our legal process. Our jury system makes everyday citizens a part of our legal process in a super significant way, but no one ever really explains how that process works. People don't know what the objections mean. And I think it's important to have that base level knowledge, but also it feels like sports commentating. Like, what is this lawyer doing? And that's, that's a, I'm putting a flag on that objection. Wrong, obje absolutely wrong objection. Terrible. So there's a blend of that. And I absolutely love it. Yeah. That's something I really love about your content is that you are making learning the law accessible to viewers at home. Like you're showcasing documents and you're like, here's what this means. Here's what that means. Cause I know a great deal of people could read through a contract for signing a lease on a rental or going through some sort of financial hardship and going through paperwork for that. And they don't understand it. I think it's similar to the blockades we have in the States on taxes. People go through and they want someone to do their taxes for them because it's really confusing. And I think it's purposefully confusing. So people can't maximize the benefits that they get. Oh, um, we the tax code forever. Um, oh, yes. I, I took multiple tax and business associations classes in law school because I was, I've always been a little fascinated with it. But the tax code, we were still very book heavy when I was in law school because that mm. was, you know, a, a while back. And the tax code was too gigantic stacks on onion paper in like nine point font. It was impossibly thick to dig through. My professor, who I think was around when the tax code was originally written, had to have one of the students carry the books to class because they were so large and significant. And so the tax code is a, a very, very deeply confusing code. It is not meant to be easily decoded. Yeah, exactly. That's the, how I think most people feel. I think also attending law school is a privilege that many don't have in this country, especially in this day and age. What have you learned from teaching an audience with a wide spectrum of knowledge on the law? What has it taught you maybe as an attorney or as someone who's just fascinated with these cases? I knew that there was a lack of kind of legal literacy in the U.S. I don't like that law is so gate kept because it impacts everything we do from registering our car to how much you're going to get fined if you're, you know, smoking on a sidewalk, depending on where you live. It impacts every single area of our life pretty substantially in some ways. I mean, if you talking about the tax code, if you interpret it wrong, you could end up in jail. Like that's not insignificant. It's not like you just paid the wrong amount. If, if you interpret it wrong, there could be significant penalties for that. So I knew that there was a level of legal literacy that I hoped to bring to an audience. I also find a lot of lawyers do not bring their, their knowledge level to an audience level. Um, sometimes I think intentionally so, which I absolutely hate. There can be a bit of snobbery in the law. And that is, is something I think lawyers do for other lawyers. Like, what will other lawyers say about my coverage? I'm like, other lawyers aren't my audience. I have a lot of them in my audience, 
but that's not who I'm making content for. So I knew that that's how I wanted to explain things. And what I didn't realize is how much the US legal system impacts an international audience. I am constantly blown away by how many in our international law community want to understand what the US is doing because of the ripple effects it has elsewhere. And I do that through pop culture cases. But people are like, wait a second. So your jurors are just like people who are missing work, like that they're told to be there. I'm like, yes, they're like, that's the wildest thing I've ever heard. And a lot of countries don't have a jury system like ours. And then when you have these big celebrity cases, because US pop culture is so impactful worldwide, you have a lot of interest and a different level of understanding. And I've learned a lot about the laws elsewhere from lawyers from other countries that are in the community, how lawyers do things. They learn things from how we do things. And it opens a conversation in a way that's not adversarial, but curious. And when conversations start out of curiosity, it you have a much better result than when they start adversarially. Yeah. Have you seen the movie Anatomy of a Fall that just came out? No, I have not. You should see it because it it is a German woman who is getting tried in a French courtroom and she can speak French, but they force her to speak French. And the prosecuting attorney, I don't know exactly what they call it in France, but he is so antagonizing and it really feels like everything is set up against her in a way that, I mean, I have my own issues with the American legal system, but it was fascinating watching this and being like, I cannot believe this is how this is being conducted. And it is a fictional movie. I would love to see your response to it because I was blown away at what was going on. It was shocking to me just watching it in a movie. Yeah. So I would love to see that. Absolutely. The thing I enjoy seeing when breaking down, especially courtrooms from across the country, is not only the regional differences, but reminding the community that lives there, like you don't, if you don't love this result, you can change it. Like the legislatures can change these laws. We can change the way things work, but you can't make that change if you don't understand. And so if you don't even know what to ask for, you say, I don't like this. I want things to change. But when you know what laws at play or what rules are at play, it's a lot easier to say, these are the rules that need to change because they're the thing that impacted the result. And I've watched that from, from state to state to state. And most recently in Utah with the Ruby Frankie, the Jody Hildebrandt sentencing, the law nerds in Utah were horrified to look at that case and the counts and multiple victims, knowing that no matter what, the maximum was always 30 years. They're like, how is that the law? And I'm like, that's the law. They're like, okay, who changes the law? I'm like, okay, go Google who your, your state representative is and ask them why this is the law. You can ask. It is your government. And you can ask them to change it. And you're not going to be alone because there were 40,000 people watching this trial on, on my channel alone. And that's, that's enough people to impact change. So when people have understanding, they know what to ask for. And I think that's incredible. And that's why I like covering cases from across the country. I only practiced in one county in one state, but we've gotten to watch trials from across the U.S. And I'm still waiting for the federal system to show us what's going on inside their courtrooms because uh, they sure don't want to do that. So that's one of the things I'm excited to see the law nerds continue to advocate for and me continue to advocate for because our federal courtroom is where like all the shit goes down. Yeah. And they're very closed to the public. A hundred percent. I love that you highlighted the Ruby Frankie case because the 30 year max is, I remember hearing that at a podcast and I was so astounded because of what happened. Yeah. You're like, how is that the rule? Like, how is that? How is that just the rule? That is the rule. There is no, that is the rule. No exception to the rule. Nothing changes. If they had charged for four victims or more, that is the rule. If they had charged for 20 counts or more, that is the rule. And also Utah sentences indeterminate. So it's just a range and somebody else decides not it's it. It was illuminating to me as well. Cause I was like, wait, but you do sentencing how, but then, you know, we're in South Carolina and they sentence Alec Murdoch to two life sentences the day after trial. I'm like, wait, you're going to sentence him like eight hours from now? What is happening? Also oh, shocking. Also, shocking. I mean, to me, definitely well-deserved, but also shocking. Normal, but normal for, normal for them. And so it's really interesting to talk about, it's such a large country and talk about the regional, regional differences. Though South Carolina, at the end of all their affidavits, says, further affiant saith not. 
And I want every state to adapt that because it is just, it's like an old English font and it's kind of baller and I love it. Yeah. That's what this episode should be titled. Further affiant saith not. <laughs> it's so funny. But you never know. It's it's not just like under the penalty of perjury, I affirm. It seems so boring after that. Their jury instructions also talk about the cloak of righteousness. So I I totally dug it. I'm like, these jury instructions are absolutely amazing, the language that they use. And it's interesting to see from the East Coast to the West Coast, the legal systems that were set up further further in time from the ones on the West Coast. So you can see kind of that difference as you shift in some of the languaging and traditions and histories, the further we get from kind of the English law tradition, but that's going to get very nerdy into history very quickly. <laughs> yeah, which is fascinating. And I think people who follow your content definitely will want to see that as time goes on, for sure. They're all sitting here yelling, yes, when it goes back to the Magna Carta, we've got questions. <laughs> Please. <laughs> I have two comments before I ask you a question. Number one, about the title, uh, another one I thought of is how Emily Baker became the GOAT live streamer, which works because like <laughs> um, you are yeah. one of the greatest. <laughs> I mean, where did I write it down? She is the, and she, this is one of your quotes, the internet's go-to legal analyst. And that's a huge title, but it's so true for you. So and true. So, yeah, the... The goat also works because of the screaming goat thing. Because well, I didn't even pick up on that. No, because yeah. of Vincent. Oh, absolutely. And what's interesting to me is now our trial coverage, our live concurrent viewers triple, sometimes quadruple or more other more traditional forms of coverage. So there are other other channels and, and large media channels that stream, but we are the number one place for trial streams on YouTube. And that blows my mind sometimes. They're like, when our live concurrent viewers are, you know, quadrupling court TV, which is what I grew up with, it's it's wild to me, but it's because people want to have a conversation about the case in real time and other outlets do not do that. Yeah. They don't yeah. want to be left out of the conversation, which a lot of court mm -hmm. TV you watch. I mean, I remember watching the Alec Murdoch case and I was fascinated with that case, consumed probably every documentary, every podcast, everything that was out there. And I was watching the trial and I was like, why am I bored now? Mm -hmm. And it's because you need that sort of interaction. You need, I mean, I find, I think of myself as someone who is very well-versed in some of these cases, but not with the actual law terms that will come up in the court that will determine what happens. So to yeah. have someone like you, I think is a huge service to the community, in my opinion. And to remind people that there is going to be a day in every trial where the attorneys pull out a million different exhibits and they need to be marked into evidence and laid foundation. And what does that mean? And we take those days as an opportunity to answer questions and talk about what evidence is and what, you know, what the receipts are, if you will, and how you lay foundation and what is proper foundation. How do you authenticate that something is real and it came from where they said it came from? But if you're just watching that, it is a slogging day in court going through Item number 369, where did you recover this from and how did you recover it? And did you put it in this envelope? Is that your signature? It can be a very long, boring day in court. It's boring for the lawyers too. Yeah, I bet. Truly. The, other thing, after lunch. the other thing I loved is when you said we stream now, I feel like that's also, that would be a great title for like a documentary of your origin story. <laughs> it really is. It's like we stream now. This is what we, this is what we do. And I can't imagine creating content in another way. Cause I can't imagine not having that conversation. Yeah, that, that totally, that's powerful. And speaking of like documentaries and traditional media companies, correct me if I'm wrong. I, I believe you've turned down deals from traditional media companies just to keep creating content independently. First of all, is this correct? Uh, there, there have been definite opportunities that I have turned down. We have never, I've never gotten to the deal stage to turn it down because normally at the outset, I'm like, where's the audience interactivity in that? And so right. I'm happy to be a guest commentator. But when people are like, we could see you doing this, I'm like, and where is the interactivity in that? Because where is the conversation in that? Oh, there's not. Well, I'm not interested in in doing that if we're not having a conversation with the law nerd community. But I have been a part of a lot of traditional media projects as a legal expert. And that's always fun. The community is like, oh my God, we got to see you. And then they get to just ask me yeah. questions after it airs. But honestly, I hate sitting down to film for two and a half hours for somebody to use five minutes of footage. It's like I could be streaming. Like I honestly, I could be streaming. And so I'm tempted in the future to be like, Let's let me just stream everything you ask me, and then you can clip down whatever you want for whatever project we're working on. We'll see who goes for it. But 
it's uh, it's it's interesting the way traditional media works to make sure that they have their bases covered and how much ends up clipped out and on the floor because it doesn't flow with how they're doing things. I'm like, ugh, that sounds miserable to me. I don't want to do that. Yeah, let's dive let's dive deeper deeper into that. Like, can you talk about the discussions that you had with them and why you ultimately decided off that you were better doing your own thing? Like, it sounds like interactivity is one of the big parts of it, and that's how what's like the foundation of how you built your community in the first place. My focus has always been helping people understand the law, and you can't do that in a one-sided conversation. If people wanted to understand the law in a one-sided conversation, they could you know, pay the couple hundred thousands of dollars to go to law school or what have you. And that's not what I want to do. And even in law school, it's a very interactive process. So it's, it's just that I love live streaming. Even when I look at people ask, you know, are you going to clip these things down and, and put out, you know, six shorts a day and, and do this or that? I'm like, where is the conversation in that with the community? Because I will do those for informational purposes. Like this thing just happened Here's a quick explanation. We'll talk about it on stream, but it's not the purpose of streaming is not to repurpose it into shorter videos. The purpose of streaming is to break it all down and for people to understand. When I do repurpose it into shorter content, it's to help those that are like, I couldn't catch the live stream this week, but I don't want to miss out on what's going on on this trial. So keep me up to speed. It's it's to facilitate the community's access and understanding when life gets busy because it does. So when I look at traditional media, if I'm not going to have that interactivity and if I'm not going to have that control over the cases I talk about, then it's going to be a no. And that tends to be the first conversation and things kind of begin and end there. But I'm again, I'm happy to be a part of projects. I was part of the Queen of the Con podcast, which was really a fun project to be a part of. I did The Housewife and the Hustler Part 2 with Hulu. I've done a lot with ABC. But those are those are things that I can do in addition to streaming, and they don't pull me away. But it's never been the goal to move away from the community. It's always, how do we move more into the community and let other people know that our community exists? Like, hey, you don't have to just watch this thing by yourself. You can have a conversation about it with people who also want to have a conversation about it without making fun of the witnesses. If you look at some of the live stream chats on other channels that don't really moderate their chat that are just streaming the trial, Mm -hmm. the comments can be horrific. When people are on trial, they don't want to be there generally. So attacking them is, is gross to me, truly. So we talk about what they've said. We've talked, we talk about, you know, how a witness presents, but we don't attack them. They don't want to be there. And they definitely don't have any control over whether it's streaming to the internet or not. So, you know, we are, there have been times though, particularly with canines, if an officer has a canine, the conversation will always be about that adorable pooch. But other than that, we really keep it to talking about the content or funny things that are said. And people need a place to talk about what they're experiencing and watching especially when they're captivated by a trial and they want to go home and be like, oh my God, this thing happened in court today. And their you know, family or partner might be like, I couldn't care less about this thing that's going on. Just want to talk about it with somebody. Mm-hmm. And that's what the community does. So that's how I make decisions for everything I do. It is community driven. So why is there a merch shop? Because the Lawnards asked for it. Why is there a lip gloss collab? Because the Lawnards asked for it. Why did we build our own app? Because the law nerds were not getting notifications and it was the best way we could figure out to get them notifications that we were in control of. Everything is in response to what our community needs. I love that. You just answered like three of the questions I was going to ask. (laughs) We can still talk about them if you want to. (laughs) Yeah, we'll come back to those. But I, I love this interactive aspect and it feels like the most human of the content that's out there right now. I love Katie's comment about how when she watched a trial in a different format, she was bored by them. But then when she watches your live streams, she feels like, oh, okay, now I get it. And I have this other group of like people to talk to about it. It feels so like human. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's also really great too. I love, I, and I didn't even think of this. I love the point that you made that when you go on other streams, people are making comments about people that are irrelevant and oftentimes are really, really gross and things you'll see on the internet. but not only do you make decisions about actual deals for your community and what will benefit them and base your content around it, but also you've seen the things out there 
that other people will put up and be like, yeah, this isn't productive to your learning. I understand that I can give you a resource outside of this where we can have legitimate discussions because I bet it's just trolls, people making these comments, but then you go to your stream and it's like, okay, like, Maybe if these trolls took a second to come to another location and actually engage in a conversation, they would understand more of what was going on. Maybe more of us would. And yeah. it, there is such a barrier to entry that I think you are trying to break through, but it is really awesome that you are noticing trends outside and how you can sort of, I'm trying to think of the word I want to use, sort of gear your content towards avoiding that and actually avoiding and, and, and cultivating understanding and less toxicity too. You can't, you, you actually can't learn neurologically if, if you are kind of in that fight or flight stage, if you feel attacked or if the witness who's talking and you see a bit of yourself in that witness and then people are attacking them, it makes you feel on the defensive. You can't learn about a case that way. And also I'm very mindful that the people who are going through these trial processes don't want to be there. And are subpoenaed to be there or have been, you know, they've done a thing that the state thinks is illegal. So they've been arrested and they're being prosecuted. And we're going to see all together if a jury decides whether they did the thing or didn't do the thing or had a reason to do the thing. But that's not a pleasant experience for anyone. I have been a trial lawyer long enough to have conversations, not just with defendants and defense attorneys, but victims, victims, families, and witnesses. And there is a push pull towards transparency in courts versus harassment of witnesses, versus the internet interceding into high-profile trials. And it's something that I think we're all trying to navigate in real time. And I know that my community will be part of the solution. And the more brains we have on a thing, the better it's going to be. But I don't want watching trials to be like a blood sport to dehumanize the people involved in the trial it should be a way to learn and explore and understand. And we do that, I think, very well with not just moderation, but the rules we have, but our community also self-regulates. If people come in and start talking about a witness, they're like, hey, we don't do that here. And then if they keep it up, we just literally block them from the chat because my goal is not more live concurrent viewers or more subscribers. My goal is more law nerds. And there are people who they're like, oh, wait, we're in a different space on the internet. I can't just like name call people. Mm -hmm. Weird. And then they're like, okay, and now we can have a conversation. They're like, oh, wow, that's different, but we'll do it. And there's some who just won't. And that's okay. They can, they can go somewhere else. Yeah. hundred percent. Yeah. It, it gives me so much more hope for humanity when I see that content like yours is succeeding and resonating with people. Cause that's what more people are going to like, people are voting with their attention, right? And to see that kind of vibe rise to the top is really awesome. It's funny when you talk about voting with attention. I will share with you guys something I don't, I don't share a lot of kind of the behind the scenes of my channel on the internet, but I know that's something that people look for here. Mm -hmm. This last month, my average view duration was 49 minutes. So when we're looking at people voting with their attention, the AVD on my channel is regularly somewhere between like 47 and 47 to like 50. 5, 56 minutes across the channel. And so when you talk about attention on YouTube, there is a space for long form conversation in live streaming. It takes intentionality, but there's room for it. And there's an audience that's hungry for it. Unfortunately, there is also a push on other platforms, not YouTube into the, you know, IRL streaming where people are hate watching just to see if somebody's going to get punched, shot or arrested. And I don't know how much that brings people up and is worth their time and attention, but there's also a train wreck aspect to it. So when we look at positive community, there's room for it and it crushes on YouTube. When you look at our live concurrent viewers, we have more live concurrence regularly than channels with four times the amount of subscribers and larger than media platforms that are running ads to their content because there's something of value there that people want to be a part of. Yeah. And you don't have to sacrifice your morals for it. No. And I get to choose what I cover. And so I, I've had other content creators out of genuine curiosity be like, are you going to cover this? It would drive so many views. I'm like, it's not something I want to cover. And if I don't want to do it, my audience is going to understand. And also, I don't think there are particularly cases. I don't want to, I don't want to cover it because of the topic, because there's child victims, be, because of whatever. 
because there's no room for learning there. And so if we can't learn something through a trial, then there's, there's no value to it for me because just more views is not the goal. 100%. And on the other side of that, like high AVD is obviously you being on stream for a long time. I've seen live streams where you were there for up to eight hours. Could you talk about how you developed that stamina? Well, I, I don't really know if it's ADHD or just my background in trial, but if I'm invested in a thing, like we can't stop talking about it until we're done. Like I can't, we have to finish, especially with trial days, but we, we did start breaking for lunch to take a little bit of time off stream during uh, during trial, which works much better for me to break those into to chunks. But it's a lot easier to sit in my chair in my office with snackies and a drink doing trial coverage than standing in court doing trial coverage. Trial days as the trial lawyer start very early in the morning, particularly if you need hair and some amount of makeup on. Uh, you work through lunch to talk with witnesses. You talk to witnesses before court, and then you're working four plus hours after court ends to prep for the next day take care of your other cases and take care of witnesses. So an eight hour day for a trial day is short compared to what my career was. So the quality of life aspect of streaming that long is definitely better, but I also have something I'm interested in talking about and that helps. Yeah. Oh, I never thought about it that way. You're right. So I guess you. this is actually easier than what you used to do. You already have that like high stamina from beforehand. This is much easier than what I used to do. It is, I can't underestimate it. And I try to. I try to say it in content Sometimes I forget to give grace to the lawyers because I realized by the end of trial, they've been sleeping three or four hours a day and are in tremendously high stress situations. And I'm glad I'm not them, but also there are times they do stuff that is just so funny. And, and I know exhaustion plays into that, but trial attorneys, particularly criminal trial attorneys, have to have an amount of stamina because there's, there's really no, no breaks in that career. Civil's a little bit different where they go to trial every couple of years, if that. But in criminal law, it is it is day in and day out in court. So it it really comes it comes from the career. But I played Division One college water polo as well. Like I'm not unfamiliar with long days. Oh, that's that's badass. Uh, Joanne mentioned that you're one of the few content creators who are sort of like managed by YouTube, and you have a more direct relationship with them. I don't know how much you can share about this, if anything. But what does that involve? What kind of conversations are you having with them? I, I don't know if I would call it managed by YouTube, but I have a partner manager with YouTube who is an absolute and tremendous help. I changed partner managers in January. YouTube has a variety of different partner manager programs, but I had gotten an email, gosh, a while back that was, hey, are you interested in the partner manager program? And I filled out like a little survey. And then like six months later, I got an email from somebody who was like, hey, I'm your partner manager do you want to set up a call? And you would book a 30 minute call. And they're like, so just taking a look at your channel, we can give you some insight into your analytics. And then as my channel grew, I was, I kind of moved through other partner managers who have been tremendously helpful. So when I have questions about, Hey, this video got demonetized. I don't really understand where the issue was. Can you explain it to me versus me trying to dig through and guess? Generally, it's because I forgot words were said in court that are not super friendly. There's one in particular that YouTube is like the giant no button comes down. I was like, oh, I forgot. That's the day that they were talking about the the, the name calling with the see you next Tuesday. My bad. Oh. I, I forgot that that happened that day. I wouldn't have monetized it otherwise because court is dynamic. And so we talk about that. We We have, I've had the opportunity to talk with the product teams with regard to fan funding and memberships which has been really tremendous and to give my feedback and what I've noticed in my community. So it's, it's nice to be able to have conversations on that level with YouTube. And that is something I don't know how they decide, but something that has grown, I would imagine it has something to do with the amount of live concurrent viewers that we have that the platform was like, wait, what are you doing I'm over <laughs> there? That's, that's unique. And then I learned that yeah. there were a number of the executives at YouTube who are also obsessed with trial coverage, my trial coverage. So it helps that they were familiar with my content as well, because truly when you are a creator, you never know who's watching. And I learned that very much when I cover trials of 
the emails that I get, the DMs that I get, who's who's watching those trials. I love that. I'm going to now go stalk the YouTube execs on LinkedIn and wonder which one of these are law nerds. There's a there's a good few of them. So it's it's been it's been really fun, but I I didn't start creating content to get people's attention. I started creating content to explain things that were happening. And the thing is we all court is unlike anything else. And we all kind of want to know what's going on. Like there is no drama like court drama. There is no gossip like court gossip. It's like, did you see this latest filing? She was having an affair before, before she allegedly poisoned her husband. Are you kidding me? Like it's, it, it just all comes out and it, it's fascinating to watch it unfold, whether it starts with covering the trial or whether it starts with covering when somebody gets arrested. It's interesting to watch it unfold. And then these massive civil cases are are wild and the lawyers are catching on. So the lawsuits have changed over the last five, six years, and they are written much more for media consumption. And lawsuits are getting disclosed to media outlets before they are necessarily hitting the public filing system. So the law PR game has ratcheted up to another level as well. Interesting. So when you previously prepared for trial as a trial lawyer, I can only imagine that your research would be really different from the research that you do now. How do you compare the two? I know you were talking about those really long hours previously. And could you take us through your research process for your streams? It's it's truly not tremendously different, except now I don't have to wrangle witnesses. Like I am not also trying to manage everyone's schedule. I now have someone else to manage my schedule, which is a blessing of all blessings. So I really get to focus just on the case and not on all the moving pieces and organizing them, which makes it a lot less time consuming. But I will go and pull the documents that I am looking at for a particular case. And depending on the jurisdiction, also research the ins and outs of the law in that jurisdiction, sometimes I will decide to pull them in groups and cover them in the filing, the answer, and then the reply to let the lawyers fight it out and convince me what the law is, because that's how judges are approaching things. And so when I'm looking at the audience, I'm like, tell me whose argument is persuasive. Let's go through. This is what they're arguing. That's the reply or the opposition. And then that's the reply. What what are you convinced by? And letting the audience also work through that process with me. Before I became a DA, I was a research attorney for LA Superior Court judges. So I saw the process that they would go through in researching the law behind a case and kind of determining where they stood. So I try to also bring that in to the audience and be like, well, I don't know if I agree with their interpretation of this case and this is why. And those are very much Lawnard University Law School days. But sometimes we will say, hey, this trial is going on. I haven't researched it a ton. You haven't researched it a ton. Let's let's look at opening statements and see who convinces us and follow along as if we're jurors. Because when you're a juror, you're supposed to come in with very little knowledge about the case. And so sometimes we approach it that way. It just depends on the case and the timing of where we're at. But it's, you know, pulling documents, reading the documents, breaking them down, looking at what the law says, looking at what the cases say, and seeing if the if the Uh, lawyers convince me as to their side or not. I I didn't even think about until we talked about it today, how different the law is from state to state. So I bet that's definitely a learning curve, but an exciting one. So you have to be sort of open to what happens in each state and how different it was from when you were truly practicing law in court. And research, I mean, is basically what law school teaches you anyway. (laughs) It teaches you that you know nothing and everything needs to be looked up. So yeah, we, we start from there. Yeah. We touched on this a little bit earlier, but what's your moderation strategy for streams where the chat is so busy that like it just flies by? Do you have multiple moderators? Do they pin comments they think are valuable? Do you always try to address super chats? We have a wonderful group of moderators. We have a pretty thorough onboarding process. Mm-hmm. Moderators are an extension of you and your community, and they are an example of you and your community. What we try to do through moderation is on our smaller streams, and by smaller, I mean our, you know, 10,000 to 13, 14,000 community member streams. We talk about kind of how we do things, what the rules are, what what we like, and the moderators will kind of go in and, and redirect if need be. But we are four plus years into this, and the community will redirect people first. 
So our moderation approach has changed as the community's grown to really helping identify either questions to bring to my attention for my producer who is in the back end of StreamYard and will go through and star comments. The moderators have a separate channel where they can communicate about something if they're not if they're not sure or if something is going on in the chat that I need to be aware of, it will happen. I stream enough that breaking news will happen while I'm on stream and the moderators will either kind of redirect or bring something to my attention, depending on what it is. I don't like covering breaking news. I am not a news anchor. So, and especially for watching live trial, it's hard to navigate those two attentions at once. But our moderators really support the community if they're redirecting and then block spam if need be when it gets really busy. Because when the chat is really over 50,000, it gets very difficult to, to engage in kind of proactive moderation. It's just blocking things that are are a problem. And YouTube actually does a really good job with that, with their moderation tools, including how long somebody has been a subscriber before they can chat and things like that. So we use the tools that are available to us through YouTube too, but our community really does help identify those things for the moderators so that it's not as much of a heavy lift, but it was more of a heavy lift at the beginning as this community was growing and we were kind of navigating where where the boundaries are and where positive conversation is, where the ability to disagree in the chat, how far we let that go and things like that. So we try to give the chat as much free reign as we can, as long as people stay within within the general no name calling, kind of no no name calling, no doxing, very general rules. So they help foster that positive environment and really now back up the community when they say, okay, this is this is this person is a problem. And the community highlights okay. people that just pop in to troll. And it's it's rarer now because when you have that many people on stream, if they don't get the attention they want, they just kind of leave. Like if they can't come in and derail the chat, they just stop and go away. So we don't we don't feed the trolls. We talked about this previously, but sort of on this topic, and I did say I would come back to this, you have a really devoted fan base. What has it been like cultivating that community? And what are the risks creators should look out for if they want to build one like yours? I know it's super positive, so I'm wondering about the risks. Well, no, there's a, there's there's always risk to being an online creator, but it's really incredible and supportive to turn on a live stream and know you're going to go talk with your friends. I have seen lots of streamers who just fight with their chat. I can't imagine what it would be like to know that you're going to sit down to stream and you're just going to be arguing with people all day. Like that sounds absolutely miserable to me. I don't want to argue with people all day long. I'm I'm a lawyer, but in court, there are rules to that. The internet, the internet has its own unwritten set of rules, but they are very different than like court decorum rules. So even though I engaged in an adversarial process, there were a whole lot of boundaries on that. It's more like debate team, really. You have you have rules and boundaries and guidelines, and you know generally that things aren't going to go completely off the rails. The internet, not so much. So in building the community, it was really rewarding finding people who are like, you know, I, I work from home because of the pandemic, or I I don't work anymore because of of life circumstances or whatever. And I feel like I can go and have positive social engagement with people who want to talk about the the nerdy stuff that I'm into, make the jokes about movies and music that I know too, talk about cases. And you feel like you have a community like an old school, like AOL chat room that my friends and I used when we were in you know college or, or law school. And that experience, people are losing that in their real life, especially as work shifts. You don't go in and ask your coworkers always how their day is going if you're not going to see them or if you you know aren't having Zoom meetings that day. So our chat comes in and asks how each other's doing, talk about their pets, their life, their kids, their their you know their struggles and their wins and it's really incredible to see because it gives people a place to go and have great interactions and have a community that they're really excited to go be a part of. And it's fun to see that play out in person when I run into people, which happens more often than I ever would have expected it to doing, doing what I do. I don't really, I look at Nashville and, and all of the incredibly famous people in Nashville. I'm like, how am I getting recognized in the grocery store? I'm a, I'm a streamer. Like it's, it's a very different thing. So with that, the risks are that depending on how you create content, there will be people who will go too far and try to find out too much. I have been doxxed. I've never been swatted, but that's because local law enforcement is very proactive and aware. And I also went to them when we were having issues with 
doxing and threats. People have tried to disclose where my kids go to school, which causes concern. However, my kids go to school at schools where country music stars, kids go to school, where we have other high profile individuals, and these are public schools, or other high profile individuals, kids go to schools. So the school is not unfamiliar with, uh, hey, by the way, this this is going on just, just so you're aware. But it's one of those things to be mindful of. I'm very mindful about not sharing my location in real time. I'm very mindful of not sharing where my kids are in real time. I talk to my kids about social media and what they choose to do on social media because there will always be those who are looking for their activity. Luckily, my kids are both like, I'm not really... I love watching YouTube videos, but I don't really want to engage in social media in that way, which is just people are like, how, how do you do that? I'm like, I, I don't, I don't know. That is my kid's choice, but we talk about it. But I was aware of some of those things because of my prior job. I had experienced having police protection on my house. I I've had other circumstances with work where I've had to be mindful of just personal safety. And overall, it's not been too much of a problem. You if you are aware, I think you can absolutely navigate it, but you have to be mindful of it going in. And I think that's important. I think the biggest problem I'm seeing for creators right now is people trying to hack their channels and trying to like send the, send what is like a fake brand deal with a brief and you hit the link and the link will take over your channel. So that type of cybersecurity becomes more and more important for creators to not have their channels taken over. I've had people try to get into every social media account I have into my YouTube channel and all of that. So there's a level of digital security that that needs to be taken very seriously when it's your business. So it, that is that is a very real thing. But I love seeing the lawn in, in person. I run into them all over the place from cruise ships to Disney World. And it's, it's a blast because every time I run into people in real life, we have something to talk about. It was like, oh my God, can you believe this case or that case? Or which trial did you like the most? Or who are you following? And can you believe this lawyer on that day of this trial? And so we always have something to chat about. The lawn arts are really incredible. And that's different. Like I'm not a creator that's going to walk around the floor at VidCon and be swarmed by kids. I'm a creator whose parents are going to be like, oh my God, you're here. <laughs> so there's, I'm joking with a, a number of creators at VidCon that they're like, so your audience, I'm like, I'm your mom's favorite YouTuber. That's just, that's where we're at. And so I would get text messages and creators are like, no, but my mom totally loves you. I'm like, mm-hmm. I know <laughs> that's where we're at. So I, I do have an audience that trends older than an average YouTube audience. And it's really incredible to see. And I, I will joke about it and they will joke back with me about it. But I have people in the chat that are like, girls, stop saying you're old. I'm 75. And I'm like, I love so much that you're in the chat with us right now. But then I have others in the chat who are like, can you stop saying we're all the same age? I'm like 23. And I'm like, how did you find this channel? <laughs> Seriously. <laughs> Occasionally we'll get trolled with somebody who's like, I will talk about something. And they're like, oh my God, that was like 10 years before I was born. I'm like, stop it. Go away. <laughs> oh, no, it's, it's, it's really fun. Um, that is fun. It's really fun to see. And people who are like, no, but I've watched you all through college and I watch you while I study. And I found you in high school. My kid has walked in and seen like walked into the lunchroom at his high school and seen people watching my streams on their mobile phones. That must be and crazy. He's like, I don't know if they know that like I'm your kid. So I don't like say anything. He's like, it's weird. But with the lights, it's pretty identifiable. If somebody's watching an EDB stream, you can tell during, I think it was during Depp v. Heard, somebody super chatted in the chat. Like I'm on the bus in Sweden and there are two other people on the bus on their phone watching you. And so I pulled it up and I can just imagine these people on the bus, like looking around and seeing the other lawn in real time. I have had people email me that they've run into lawn when they're vacationing abroad and somebody saw their shirt and then they all went out and got drinks. Like it's a really vibrant community. um, And that's a really cool thing. So sweet. I don't remember what the question was. Oh, it was about the, the kind of pitfalls. You have to be mindful if you're a content creator, but I think that's true if you are on the internet in any way at all. Yeah. You answered it for sure. But (laughs) <laughs> it was just a beautiful anecdote after. I know, I right? So it's sweet. I have an image of my head of like a college student, her mom and like the grandma all sitting in the living room watching one of your streams. People yeah. definitely talk about the case with friends and family. I did a live event in Nashville a number of years back and two women came and came up and we were chatting. They had been coworkers that had lost touch. They saw each other's name in the chat and reconnected and decided to take a girl's trip to Nashville to come see the live event because they saw each other in the live chat. And that 
story has replicated more than once of people who were like, I had lost touch with somebody and then we saw each other in the live chat and reconnected. It's really, it's really incredible when you find somebody who has something in common. I had somebody super chat. They're like, my boss walked by and heard you on my screen and said, oh, you're watching Emily. You're busy. I'll come back. And I was like, what? That's an, I love it. Boss is a law nerd. So that's amazing. That's, that's cool. so amazing. Yep. How do these totally. <laughs> And how, how does your community help you like decide the direction of your, your content and the stories you cover? Like your Patreon mentions that they do this. Can you walk us through how you gather that information and how you balance what they want and what you want to do? I ask them. So I ask the law nerds for a lot of input. I ask them to vote, particularly the members. I ask them to vote on merchandise. Like, do you like this design or that design? I ask them, hey, there are, especially when we are stuck between a lot of cases going on at once. I will say what has priority for you guys and put up polls and let them vote in the YouTube member spaces and the Patreon member spaces and see what they want. But when something sparks the law's interest, I will get DMs across every platform you can imagine. Comments, like the latest comments on my YouTube videos will be about the thing. Emails, the law nerds will let me know what they're interested in. But for me, it takes some of that decision-making weight off. I think some content creators are like, what can I make that's going to get pushed by the algorithm? And it's never even a consideration when I am making content is what do the law nerds want to talk about today? And if I'm ever stuck on, I can't get to everything, I just ask them because if we're having a conversation about what we want to talk about, the rest of the law nerd community is going to want to talk about it too. Though sometimes I will see the, yeah, I don't really care about this case all that much, but I want to hear what you have to say about it. So oftentimes the law nerds are on board, even if I just decide to go on a, a wild tangent about caterpillar cakes or, you know, crumble cookies or whatever. It's now morphed into a food court. Every now and then we do a full food court episode on lawsuits over food. And, and that's actually how the Mr. Beast, um, Beast Burger and D's Nuts lawsuits all came up in content because we were doing a food court about candy bars. That's yep. so funny. He named his candy bar D's Nuts and got sued because somebody else owns the trademark for D's Nuts. Yeah. And oh, also no. like his audience is so many kids. Like how did... Yeah, it's pulling it back to the 90s. Yeah. Uh, Ooh. My 11-year-old thought it was hilarious. Oh, I bet. I bet. <laughs> like, ama- it, it slapped with the junior high school. Mm. Absolutely. So I, I really just have a conversation with my audience and they will tell me And if they are interested and I am interested, then we cover it. I'm not going to ask them, do you want to cover this case if I'm not interested already in covering it? Yeah. But I ask them too. Oh, I just... Sorry, we will have a conversation about that as I'm thinking about the process of how I do it. We will also have a conversation if there's something I'm not covering. I will always take the opportunity to explain why I'm not covering something and how I'm making those decisions because the community is part of the process And I don't want them to feel shut out like, oh, Emily's just not covering that. I always want them to understand my decision-making process too and why I'm choosing to cover or not to cover something or when I will cover it. And so then they're not kind of left hanging and wondering if that's going to be on on the content list. And then if I know someone else is covering it who kind of aligns in the way I create content, I'll let them know where where other people are covering it. I can't cover everything that's happening while so... I'll let them know where those resources are. And I don't think, I mean, there's what, 300 million plus active users on YouTube daily. Like it, sharing other resources is never going to diminish a YouTube channel. And I, I think creators don't lean into that nearly enough. 100%. No. I just wanted to check how you're doing on time because we're almost at time. You're good. Oh, I'm, 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 let's see. I know I have another meeting at some point and I also know I'm very long-winded. No, 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 no. It's, I love this conversation. I just want to make sure that we're not having it bleed into something else you're doing. Okay, cool. So Mo, maybe ask that last question and then we'll do the last few. (laughs) Sorry, I'll try to be. No, 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 no. It's not you at all. I also like love to talk (laughs) about these things. So I'm, I'm fully excited about how this has gone. I just want to make sure we're not interrupting anything after this cuz i know yeah. you have a big streaming day. I do. I, the the reason i love having these conversations is cuz i think there's a lot of of these unwritten rules of youtube that creators get into their heads like i've got to do it this way and i've got to do it that way. You don't. You can create what you want to create with a community that wants what you're creating and build something absolutely incredible that feels like a lot of fun every day when you get to engage with them. And there's no right way to do that. There's, 
I was watching a streamer who I love, Ryan Hall, y'all. He streams weather. It is fascinating. He covers tornado outbreaks. He educates about the weather. He helps people feel prepared, not scared, which is one of his kind of buzzwords within his community. And he's streaming to 50,000, 100,000 people and helping them feel less afraid and more prepared when these massive weather events happen, but also teaching people how to understand that there is literally a community for anything that you want to talk about waiting to have that conversation with you. And there's nothing like live streaming to do it. Yeah. It's not just for Minecrafters. <laughs> no, not at all. I think we've seen that over the past couple of years. It's incredible what live streaming can do. Yeah, it is. What is next for Emily Baker? You can talk about this at any time scale you want. I mean, what is next for Emily D. Baker? I, I have been having a lot of fun being one of the top streamers on YouTube. And it's funny because like the greater streaming community doesn't always see us as streamers. I think there's so much focus on Twitch and on gaming that their people forget how significant it is. We have a very active trial calendar coming up. So there's going to be a lot of trial streaming, which I'm excited about. Live trial coverage does feel like a sports color commentary for like UFC fighting. And I love it. So I'm very excited about that. We have continued to grow our app. We are going to be moving our member community. We have a member community on YouTube that will always be there, but we're going to move a different type of member community onto the app. And I'm super excited about that. Down the road, we are also working on our own court feeds so we can just provide a better experience for our community. So we've really built a media network that's independent. The podcast is independent. Everything's run through me and my team. So I'm really excited to see what the next few years bring. In the immediate future, it's going to be hitting a million subscribers on YouTube, which at this point with the live concurrent viewers, I'm very excited about our live concurrent numbers. But it is a metric that my 12-year-old makes fun of me about constantly. So I'm very excited for my 12-year-old not to be able to say, yeah, but this YouTuber that I love has an M after their subscriber numbers. You have a K after your subscriber numbers, the shade of this child. So I'm looking forward to my 12-year-old not shading me on the regular that I'm not a real YouTuber because I don't have a million subscribers. Oh so. my gosh. <laughs> and I'm looking at him. I'm like, I had 15,000 live concurrent viewers on a live stream, buddy. And he's like, okay, after your subscriber number. Then. <laughs> the audacity uh -huh. of these YouTube Thank kids. God. Yep. Wild. But it's, it's been, it's been really fun. I, we have some live events going on. We, I have a creator collective that I'm going to be doing with YouTube that I'm really excited about. It's just been a really interesting year, but at the end of the day, it's going to be more live streaming, more trials, and more community. And that's what I'm most excited about. We stream now. We do. We stream now. It's like, let's go, guys. I just, I love watching people find our community and be like, I didn't know this existed. This is what I needed. Like, I feel like I found my people. And I'm like, you have found your people. Here are your law nerds. And we also make jokes about Star Wars and Dr. Hugh or Dr. <laughs> Dr. Hugh, Dr. <laughs> Who and, and Dr. Strange and everything you can imagine. So it's, it's nerdy on a lot of levels. And that's a, a really fun community to be a part of. And I talk about my oldest being in band. The amount of band kids in my community is exponential. And it's amazing to me. I'm like, great. We just, I, I think one day we had a rumble in the chat between band kids and theater kids. It was fantastic. Oh my um, God. There's a lot of crossover also. So it was, it's just really fun. We really created the table that we want to sit at and that's been fun. So much more of that because there's a lot of people who don't know what we're doing and, and would love it were they to know it existed. That's an awesome response. I am super excited for the, for the next chapter. We like to end these interviews with a, a series of short questions. One of them you've kind of already answered, but can you shine the spotlight on a creator you enjoy watching? So Ryan Hall, y'all, that's one. First of all, how do you spell his last name? Y'all, why? Yeah. Ryan Hall, L-L, -L, y'all, why? Apostrophe A-L-L. -L. Who is a weather creator? What other, I watch all kinds of creators on YouTube. I really trust the algorithm in that way. Secretly, I, I have multiple channels. I have channels that I use for different things. So my algorithms are different on each of the channels. So I'll watch like Kara and Nate and travel content on my second channel. So that channel ends up being a lot of travel content and slice of life content, where my main channel ends up being other legal live streamers and, and research content. So those, those are two that I watch quite a lot, but also all of my fellow legal streamers. There are a ton of them and they are fantastic from Runkle of the Bailey to Law and Lumber to, you know, Boss Attorney Bree and Natalie Lawyer Chick. 
they're great. But I still watch creators that I started watching on YouTube, like I, Justine and Bailey Sarian. So it really just... I love Bailey Sarian. She's one of my faves for a really long time. Yep. I watch MKBHD. I had to stop for a bit because he makes me want to buy too much stuff. I'm like, <laughs> I'm going to be broke if I watch another MKBHD movie. Like I can't go buy another Tesla. Like what is happening? So, or another MKBHD video. So I, I watch a lot of content on YouTube and I have done since like 2006. So. So what's a piece of content you're currently obsessed with and why? This could be anything. It doesn't have to be a YouTube video. It could be a TV show, a podcast, anything. It could be a book, a newspaper. <laughs> what am I currently obsessed with? Well, I have been covering the KPD, the KPD case, which is KPD was finally arrested for the murder of Tupac in 1996. I just covered the P. Diddy stuff. So I have been listening to a lot of old school rap, which has been fantastic. But I also watch a lot of reality TV, so I am regularly watching without Miss Vanderpump Rules. I also I, I can't love stop. reality TV, so I, I get can't it. stop watching Vanderpump Rules. I can't stop. And then there's like a lawsuit going on over Ariana and Tom's house after Scandaval, and they're talking about the lawsuit and the lawyers. Well, like the amount of lawyers that have been summoned in Vanderpump Rules is fantastic. And you know, Lala Kent talked about buying a house on the proceeds from her send it to Daryl merch. Daryl is her lawyer. Like. I've never seen lawyers get this kind of love, but the cast of Vanderpump Rules loves their lawyers. There have been restraining orders. I, I, I'm, I'm in till the end. Like I, I have to see how it ends. So I get to pull the legal documents and then I get to see them talk about it on TV. Same with Real Housewives and Erica and Tom Girardi. There's, there's lawsuits that are crossing over into real time. Like I might have to go back and rewatch Dance Moms when Abby Lee Miller got indicted because oh my God. I wasn't doing legal commentary then. And I'm like, wait a second. That happened while cameras were rolling. I need to go see how they dealt with it. I love like the the legal happening in real time and then watching it play out on reality TV is something I never anticipated happening and I am obsessed with. So I can't stop, won't stop. I can't. You should can't do stop. a series of like throwback cases and do coverage on them. I wish I had time. I need the I, cases to stop. If if there's a lull in the current world of like high profile and pop culture cases, I'll stop. But like Shannon Bedore just got sued by her ex-boyfriend for $75,000. His, he says she borrowed for a facelift. Like it won't stop. It yeah. will not go down. <laughs> you must. I mean, I would just love to see you do Jody Arias and OJ and the staircase. I just, I think it'd be so There's fun. There's a lot of the Menendez brothers. There's a oh lot my of God. pieces. So if I was ever going to do legacy media, I could see doing something with those historic cases because we don't need as much of a like live stream conversation component. But OJ was like six months long. Like, I don't, I, I don't know when we would have time for that. I mean, Death yeah. Bird was six weeks. I've covered cases that are like in the six and seven week range. That's a long, it's a long time. And I'm looking at, as they're starting to set the Coburger case in Idaho, I think that's going to be about three or four months. I'm so excited for that. It's going to be a lot. So Team Baker is internally preparing for <laughs> what it looks like to cover a trial for four months. So we've, we've got great brand partners in both Green Chef and Factor. So at least I'll be eating. But we're trying to figure out like, what does this look like to do three, four months of trial? Because we've done six, seven weeks. And that's quite an extensive time commitment for, for me and for the team. So yeah, we're building internally so that we are, we are ready to, uh, to embark on whatever that, however long that trial is. So I love the diversity of your content diet. There's so much, you have so many interests. It's awesome. <laughs> it's ADHD. <laughs> I'm with you there. I yeah, get ADHD it. ADHD comes up on every interview we do. I'm, and cavemen. I, I'm really not surprised. A, People who are neurodivergent have such varied interests, but also will track down a rabbit hole like no one else's business and stay in that rabbit hole for as long as necessary. And I think there are more, more folks like that than, than the world necessarily accommodates for. And so when you find people who are like hyper-focused on the same interest you are, and you can all talk about it on the same level, it's really a lot of fun. Uh, my friend Warren, who was the one who was like, why don't you just talk for a living? this is clearly what you want to do, runs Octonation, which is the world's largest octopus fan club. Yeah, He just put out a book on octopus with Nat Geo because it is his apps. It's beautiful. Oh, it, where did I it, love it, Warren. It's beautiful. 
but he was looking for more actually educational information on octopus as a kid and there was none. And so he went on like a lifelong exploration of finding that information for himself and now bringing it to the internet, which is how he has a book out with Simon Montgomery and Nat Geo, because he was like, this is the thing I'm interested in. Why don't people love octopus as much as I do? Obviously they don't know enough about it. And same with like Ryan Hall, people don't know enough about weather and it impacts us every day. I would say same with me. People don't know enough about law and it impacts us every day. And so I'm not surprised ADHD comes up in creators because when we want to focus on our interest, we really just want to do that. And I've built a career after the thing, really of the things that I used to do when I was avoiding doing like my work work, talking about reality TV. I would have been following the Britney Spears conservatorship whether I was creating content on it or not, I would have been pulling the documents and reading them. So this is this was what I would do in my spare time. So now it's my now it's my full time. That makes so much sense. I read this theory that you needed neurodivergent people throughout evolution, like when we were cavemen, because these are the people that got obsessed with something and then made like a breakthrough or something like that. Yeah, I think I really I I really don't love the phrases neurodivergent and neurotypical. I think it's more like operating systems. Like there's iOS, there's Android, there's Unix, there's Linux. Some are more common, some are more rare. They're all just different ways to operate. And I really think our brains are more more like that. It's there's like a lot of different operating systems going on and once you kind of figure out where you're at with that, you can start to build the world around you to accommodate it. And I think we're seeing a lot more in that, especially just from watching my kids' experience now versus my experience going through school in the 90s. There is so much more awareness that we learn differently, we think differently, and there's just more conversation with kids about it so they can express it to others as well, so they can find better ways to interact and connect. Even talking about social batteries, like my very introverted kid can now say, you know what, my my social battery is a little drained, so I'm just going to put on my headphones like I'm not ignoring you. I'm not trying to be rude, but I'm I'm drained and his peers can understand that. And it's it's encouraging to see. And I think the more we talk about it, particularly the more content creators talk about it, the more people understand. And my audience, I have seen so many people in my audience say that they've either pursued diagnoses of ADHD, autism, or whatever it may be, because they've heard me and my friends talking about it. And they're like, wait, that's, that's me. Maybe this is why things have felt more difficult. And maybe I can understand myself a little better if I ask these questions and asking good questions gets better answers. And our community does that really well. So. Now, wait, I, so I've got my puddles in the background too. I see all of your puddles in the background. Is, is puddles actually getting replaced or was that an April Fool's joke? That was I, April Fool's. I couldn't tell. <laughs> it was it's, Splash, April Fool's. It's funny though, because in the end, the joke was on us. Our social media manager tried to change back the logo the day after, but X doesn't let you change back your logo. <laughs> yeah. And Joanne was like, so this might've been an issue. And I was like, the problem with Instagram is when you don't have a timeline feed, like I can't tell when something was posted necessarily. So I didn't always see all the April Fool's Day jokes on April Fool's, also neurodivergent. So I'm like, wait, is that really happening? Mm -hmm. Wait, it was just April Fool's. Is it a joke? And then I was like, oh, joke. Because I'm, ex I'm extremely gullible. So if I didn't know, I would have been like, but then I also thought it was kind of obvious, but I think it's because I, I was in on it. But I don't, if I think if I wasn't in on it, there is a moment of questioning. Oh, there was definitely a moment of questioning. I was like, he's, he's cute though. Splash is cute. Splash is cute. Splash will appearances later and become part of the StreamYard lore. Oh, yes. I'm going to write that down. I, I, can, I can see StreamYard going to events and having like, because you guys do so much with puddles, but having like one or two splashes that's like the, the shiny, it's the, the shiny StreamYard. Oh Pokemon. yeah, that special one. I know. I know. That's a great idea. I, I mean, I just love puddles and, and a little stuffy. I think mm -hmm. it's really special. A fun fact about Mo's puddles in the back. In the first episode, he was hanging upside down and everybody oh, was like, Mo. My puddles. That's that's a little dangerous and violent towards our mascot. You might want to change that. He's just suspended upside down. Hanging so by funny. his feet. Literally. Uh, it's hysterical. I love the operating system metaphor. You may have changed my life with that. And I feel like other people listening might really resonate with that. It's much, much better than what's currently being used. Yeah. I think so. There's no typical. There's just more common and less common. Any final words you want to leave the audience with? I I I, I really don't know what final words. 
I think as we've talked about quite a lot, if you want to create content, figure out who you are talking to, especially in streaming. It is about a conversation. Otherwise you wouldn't be making streaming content. You would just be creating content. If you want to create beautiful cinematography, that's very different than streaming and do that. But with streaming, it's what conversations are you having and how are you inviting your audience in to have those conversations? I started my first stream with maybe 10 people and then it grew to a hundred and then it grew to a thousand and then it continued to grow. So it's, it's really nice to appreciate how your community grows with those original members because that sets really the entire tone for your community. And I think sometimes with streaming, you can look at larger streams or, or bigger streams and be like, oh, I wish I had this many people. You have to build that to build a sustainable community. Sometimes spikes in growth can throw off your community. And so building slow and steady can create a very, very vibrant community and that is worth more than, you know, the numbers. Having that vibrant community is much more valuable and a much more rewarding experience than just streaming to thousands and thousands of people. I don't stream to thousands and thousands of people. I stream to thousands and thousands of law nerds, but it started with 10. And that's important to keep in mind as you build any type of streaming platform. And final question, where can people find you on the internet? You can find me all over the internet at the Emily D Baker from your favorite podcasting app to, of course, YouTube to the Law Nerd app in your app store. You can find me everywhere under my name, which is not something I ever really thought about when I started streaming. People are like, <laughs> you stream under your name. I'm like, I should have picked something else. I didn't even think about it. Yes, I'm having a conversation. I am me. <laughs> I am me. We stream now. We stream now just <laughs> as me. We just, it's, it's so funny because I know there are people who are like, well, what if my audience meets me in real life? It's like, well, aren't you the same? Like always? And that's not true for everyone, but uh, that's not really sustainable. If you stream, if you stream, it, it needs to be you. There will be people who want to have that conversation with you. It is much harder to do a persona as a streamer. And I don't think it's advisable at all. So yes, we stream now. I'm just me. And we like to have nerdy conversations about the law. Perfect. Emily D. Baker, thanks for being on Inside the Creator Studio. Thank you guys so much for having me. If you were watching the podcast episode last week, we did record Courtney and Emily Baker in the same day. So Mo and I are a bit delirious. We're going on four hours of recording. So the brain is definitely running low speed. And Emily records streams for a really long time. Like she does really long streams. And I truly don't know how she does it because I'm ready to keel over. <laughs> I'm so tired. So, but Emily is a big StreamYard fan. We have, I've interviewed her for a case study before. I really like the work that she does and we've interacted with her as a company a lot. So it was just really cool to finally have her on the podcast. And it was a really fun conversation, just as I expected, because she's awesome. You want to know what I want to know? Why? Like explain to me, because you're, you're really into legal cases and stuff like that. You're way more informed about this than I am. Like explain it, like the fascination with that and why you love it as a consumer. Like give me the consumer side of it. I wouldn't say I'm into legal cases as much as I'm into just true, cr true crime cases. I don't know what it is. I think I started watching a lot of like Dateline in 2020 when I was really young. Like it was just on the TV and I became really obsessed with Criminal Minds when I was a freshman in high school. I think what it is, is I really love understanding why people do things. I think a lot of people, and I think it's for good reason, sort of, I don't know, admonish true crime fanatics because it can feel really gratuitous with the amount of violence and harm that comes to families. I mean, like these cases are unimaginable. There are so many things happen that are just so horrific for the families that are involved. But as someone who consumes it a lot, I think the reason why I am so, I wouldn't say entranced, but like really so plugged into it is I want to know why people do these things. I'm very interested into the psychology of it. I think what Emily tends to do is cover a lot of legal proceedings. So we understand what's happening in courtrooms. And I think that's super fascinating and really important. And we'll talk about this in the episode, or I mean, this might be the post sample, but in the episode, we talked about this, obviously. But yeah, I, I think for me, I've, I've tried to understand it myself. And I just think it's like solving a mystery. I really love thriller books as well. I, I love fiction in general, but I think 
thrillers always get my heart beating fast. And I just, yeah, I love following a story and, and trying to figure out why a person does these things or what patterns are, how people end up going from, okay, this thing happened to this is the person who did it and how you get from point A to point B. Mm -hmm. That makes total sense. I, one thing I was surprised by, not like, not that I wasn't expecting it, but it's just like really, I found it powerful was how empathetic she was and how, how much integrity she has when she decides what to cover and how to cover it with her community. She's like really, really awesome in that way. Well, I think it's really important. I think the show that just came out about Jeffrey Dahmer that stars Evan Peters, there was a lot of backlash from the victim's families and that's totally understandable. And I think you'll never understand that perspective until you're in it. And I think she's very aware of making sure her community in the chat, they don't name call any of the witnesses. It is not supposed to be a blame game. They're just really sort of talking about what's going on and trying to understand it as a community. And she's really trying to bring to light a lot of how the American and individual state law systems work, because that's very confusing to many Americans. Honestly, if you're not, if you don't have a law degree, honestly, it can be pretty mystifying and can be really boring to watch court proceedings. And I think she has a lot of integrity, like you said, of choosing what she she wants to cover and how that will add value to the case itself, but also to her audience and their understanding of what's going on in the proceedings. And I really respect her for that. I think she is really not after clickbait. Um, She knows who her audience is. She cares about covering the trials that she knows she can add value to. And she knows that her audience will be interested in. She could hike up her viewer hours if she wanted to create clickbait, but She has the numbers to prove that she doesn't need to do that to be successful and to have user retention like she does. So yeah, I really admire it about her and I love her content. I think she's so cool. She's really, really cool. And it was really fun to talk to her again. This show is brought to you by StreamYard, a browser-based tool that lets you live stream to multiple platforms at the same time and record podcasts in studio quality. It's built for creators to make your job way easier, and it's what we use to record this podcast. This episode was recorded with StreamYard. If you want to record a podcast like this, check out the link in the description to get started. And if you want to leave us a voice message through Spotify, we'll leave a link in the description to that too. Thanks for joining us on Inside the Creator Studio. See you next time.